So given those two, ex two experiments we've just discussed, it looks like there's some empirical evidence for the unconscious mind, for the occurrence of unconscious phenomena. And there are many other ex examples that Wilson cites, then there's been plenty more produced since the published publication of that book that posit the existence of unconscious phenomena that is the positing of which is the best explanation for the data in question. Nothing special or spooky or mysterious, no one asking to, you to take their word for it, no one accusing you of, of resistance or repression if you challenge the, the experiments. The idea is this is just science. Just as about a century ago, scientists were offering evidence that supported the hypothesis of plate tectonics, so too contemporary cognitive scientists want to offer evidence that supports the hypothesis of unconscious processing. And notice that this will have some implications for unconscious desires, such as those towards sexuality and violence, but there won't be any special focus on those. So in that respect, Wilson and other colleagues will be breaking ranks with Freud, for whom sexuality and violence was at the core of our unconscious minds. Wilson and colleagues don't want to rule that out, but they don't think that that's all there is. Unconscious processing is important for language and negotiating our way through a geographical environment and face recognition and proprioception, etc., the case that we've considered thus far. And another important part of what happens at the unconscious level, according to Wilson and colleagues, is what he refers to as the psychological immune system. Just as we have a physiological immune system that allows us to fend off disease as they make incursions into us through germs, so too the psychological immune system, as Wilson wants to propose, is that we've got a system that allows us, unconscious, that allows us to fend off attacks on our self-esteem, on our self-respect, on our ability to, to be happy with ourselves and to get others to be happy with us as well. So this is represented, as, as he suggests, in, for example, the, the famous novel Jane Eyre. Jane Eyre is the heroine. She started out as an orphan. She was first taken in by Mrs. Reed, who, when she was a child, was quite mean to her. Jane Eyre finally leaves, goes off to a home for girls, grows up, makes something of her life, and then visits Mrs. Reed on her deathbed. Bronte, the author, describes the situation as follows, quoting the heroine Jane Eyre. I knew by her stony eye, referring to Mrs. Reed, I knew by her stony eye, opaque to tenderness, indissoluble to tears, that she was resolved to consider me bad to the last, because to believe me good would give her no generous pleasure, only a sense of mortification. The idea that Bronte is suggesting is that Mrs. Reed had a vested interest in continuing to be sure that Jane Eyre was a bad person, because even though the evidence was to the contrary, even had she accepted that Jane was not a bad person, it would have been mortifying to her. She would have had to admit that she had made a grave error back many years ago. And doing that would have called into question her own status as a reasonable, decent individual. Rather than do that, she insists to her dying breath with her stony eye that Jane Eyre is a bad person. And we've got everyday experience of this, I think, in many, many areas of life. When we say sour grapes, when we say, I really didn't want that job, it was stupid. I didn't want to get into that law school. I didn't want to get into that med school. I don't like that city anyway. That's an application, it seems, in a case in which our psychological immune system is working because it protects our self-esteem. It allows us to deal with rejection by saying, ah, the source of that rejection doesn't really bother me. That rejection's not a big deal because I wouldn't have gone there anyway, even if they had accepted me. Or you might once in your life have been turned down for, uh, after you had made a romantic overture and to someone, and it's very natural to respond to that rejection by saying to yourself, oh, that person was probably intimidated by me or that person doesn't have good taste anyway. Various things that we do to spin the negative things that happen to us are ways, Wilson wants to suggest, are activations of the psychological immune system. Or an experience I've seen many of my students over the years say things like the following, when they don't turn in a paper on time, or they just finish at the last minute, or some other assignment, they say, I'm sorry, professor, I know I'm such a flake, I'm a loser, I'm disorganized, and so on. And sometimes I've thought of the student in question, well, Sometimes being flaky, sometimes being disorganized, sometimes doing things at the last minute allow you to protect your self-esteem in the following way. If you don't get as good a grade as you might have hoped for, you can always say, well, that's because I waited to the last minute. But it might be that if you keep on again and again waiting to the last minute, not learning your lesson, it might be that there's a vested interest there, something about yourself that you're trying to protect. That might be the following. It might be that if you were to do your absolute best, start working on the paper well beforehand, do your absolute best on the problem set, whatever it may be, you put yourself at risk. Because if that's your best work and you still don't get, and you don't get a top grade, 
it'll be harder to, it'll be very natural to look at that res result and say, okay, that's the best I can do. I've just seen my limitations. We can harbor beliefs about our talents by never putting our limitations to the test. That's another application of the psychological immune system. Another example that's been in the press lately is the phenomenon of humble bragging, where someone might, for example, tweet or put on Facebook or some other public venue something like a complaint. Uh, they're griping about something, but underneath that griping is a certain amount of self-promotion as well. They might or might not be aware of the fact. But for example, when somebody says, oh, it's so annoying when all I want to do is go to the convenience store and buy myself some something, something to drink that people start you know, trying to ask me out on a date. It's so irritating. That is a bit of a complaint, but it's also a way of bragging about their attractiveness, for example. So now these are also ways of protecting our self-esteem by pumping ourselves up or protecting ourselves from having our self-esteem attacked because of various criticisms or challenges that we get from others. So these are applications of the psychological immune system, the ways in which Wilson wants to say we spin things in one way or another in order to, to aggrandize ourselves. And as such, the idea of each of us having a spin doctor is not necessarily a bad thing. Each of us wants to project a good image in order to be socially accepted, in order to be socially successful, in order to think well of ourselves. We want to, as it were, present ourselves in a positive and attractive light. But of course, one can only take that so far. What Wilson describes as the one of the fundamental battlegrounds of the self I think is a fairly insightful remark on his part, because on the one hand, we want to spin things in our favor. On the other hand, there's such a thing as the reality principle, where too much spin makes you completely out of touch with reality, and then your life will probably spin out of control as a result. So if you, for example, are trying to make it in a career, for, for example, acting, and every time you don't get a role in a play or a commercial or a movie or a TV show, you might say, well, there are just threatened by my incredible talents, and that's why I didn't get the role. I'll keep on trying. Well, it's good that you want to keep on trying, but if that happens again and again, it might be time after a couple of years of continuous failure to not interpret that failure in a way that involves spinning and not, that does not involve application of the psychological immune system and accept the, facts, the fact that your talents might not be as great as possible. Otherwise, you could spend the rest of your life in a pursuit that will be very unsatisfying. So spinning to a certain extent, that might be reasonable, but we need to balance that out against the fact that there is a reality that it's hard to argue with and too much spitting will result in our be behaving in a way that is not always in our best interest.